Let me talk about our first speaker tonight. Um, I grew up in the West Portal area. You know, me and my friends, we hung around and we did a lot of bad things and we had the police chief <laughs> there to watch over us. So I've known Chief Tony Rivera for a long time. Tony, when were you Chief? Like 92 to 96. 92 to 96, he's a, he, he's a, he's a tough character. He's a Vietnam vet. He's a, he, he, when I first called him about this, he said, well, you know, I, I always have to make sure, I said, we made you a panel because I don't want a panel because, you know, politics in San Francisco. I said, well, you're in the right crowd. You're with the realtors. We're always, uh, you know, kind of on the right side of issues here in the city. So I don't think you have to worry about who you're speaking to. So um, it's my honor, it really is, to have uh, Chief Tony Rivera come up. He did a wonderful job of service to the city and he continues to give back to the city. Um, so everyone, thank you, Tony. Do I need to talk into the mic? No. No. <laughs> You're good. It's okay? Yes. yes. Okay, great. Well, first of all, I, I want to thank uh, Kevin for inviting me here today, and I want to thank all of you for uh, uh, giving me your time this afternoon. Uh, I just want to tell you a little bit uh, about myself. Uh, native San Franciscan, Except for two years in the Army, have never lived any place else but San Francisco. Uh, we bought our house on 19th Avenue. You being in real estate, you, you'll cringe at these numbers. We bought our place in 1974 for $54,000. <laughs> the, the developer, this was before World War II, that built the block there, uh, his name was Costello. Ours was like the model house and the biggest one on the block. The house next door to us, an elderly woman lived there and passed away, and she didn't do any repairs, any painting, any anything. It sold two years ago, $1.2 million. And it's on 19th, the busiest street in the city. I mean, it's crazy. It's absolutely crazy. But Kevin's right, you know, the West Portal neighborhood, uh, a lot of fond memories. Kevin's brother, Sean, was a, was a great athlete. He played shortstop for me back in the day. I don't know what happened to Kevin, but Sean was very good. Uh, and it, it's kind of kind of funny. You know, I'll run into old cops, and they'll say, Hi, Chief, great to see you. And I feel flattered that they call me that. But I feel even more flattered when I run into somebody like Sean Birmingham, he says, how are you, coach? Yeah. <laughs> my baseball coaching days are my fondest memory. Uh, you know, the, the title of my speech, The City's Crime Tolerance, is San Francisco too soft on crime? Yes, yes. And, you know, this is a decision that uh, I'll let you make after we talk about some of the issues. Uh, on July 2nd, McKeer and Ross in the Chronicle wrote an article about a major medical association canceling their convention in San Francisco because the members did not feel safe in our city. And this was at the Moscone Center, and they canceled it. Uh, I think you all know that uh, tourism is our number one industry. We start losing conventions, we start losing visitors, uh, you know, we'd be, be in serious trouble. The police department comes out with regular crime statistics online, and, uh, I, you know, I appreciate that. And uh, uh, the most recent crime statistics for the first five months of the year show that property crimes are down slightly. Well, if you look at the property crimes, what does that mean? It means it was terrible last year, and it's pretty bad this year. Not quite as bad as it was last year. In terms of numbers, over 2,000 vehicle break-ins per month. Per month. And that's only reported vehicle break-ins. We know a lot more go on than that. Um, burglaries, 450 a month. 
450 burglaries per month. Violent crime uh, is not too bad. Uh, robbery and aggravated assaults are, in my opinion, pretty high. But in fairness to the city, if you compare it to other major cities, our statistics aren't too bad. I don't know if you read from time to time about Chicago. They've had over 2,000 shootings already this year. Last year, 750 people were killed on the streets of Chicago. I mean, to me, that's a war zone. And, uh, you know, here in San Francisco, we do a lot better. Uh, in recent years, we've been able to keep the homicide rate under 100 a year. For those poor people that get killed, it's still a lot, but when you compare it to other cities, it's relatively low. One of the things that concerns me is recent laws that have been passed in this state. Uh, Jerry Brown, who is a classmate of my brother at uh, St. Ignatius, nice man. He's been very, very liberal on crime. The first was uh, in 2011, realignment. You've probably heard the term bantied around. And what realignment has done, it's taken prisoners out of the state prison system and sent them to the county jails. Well, you know, first of all, logistically, that's a bit of a problem because if you go to state prison, the state has a responsibility to put you into a rehabilitation program so that when you get out, you're, you have something you can do, a legitimate job. Does it work very well? No, but it's something that they strive for. County jail has not had that responsibility. So by taking these prisoners and put them in county jail, you're kind of overwhelming the county sheriffs and, and what their responsibilities are. But more so is the amount of time that prisoners are spending in jail, which is significant, significantly less on the county jail uh, level. And one of the things of realignment, for every two days you do in jail, you get four off your sentence, unless you punch a guard or you do something terrible. So you're really doing a third of your time. Case in point, last month, a young woman broke into a car on the seventh floor of the Sutter Stockton garage to steal property. There was a little dog in the car. She stole the property, she grabbed the dog by the nape of the neck and threw him off the seventh floor of, of, the, uh, of the garage. Horrible. Obviously the dog died, seven stories. Uh, she's been on probation 13 times. She was convicted of vandalism, vehicle burglary, and abuse of an animal. She was sentenced to three years. On the way out of the courtroom, she said to the judge, F you! And, just to add to that, you're an idiot! Wow. So, so much for her respect for the criminal justice system. Three years. Under realignment, she goes to county jail. Again, four days off for two days served. She can get out in a year. You know, she was sentenced three years. Well, well why sentence her to three years if you're only going to give her a year? So this is, this is a problem of putting, putting these folks back on the street. And that's... Uh, That's a, a really nasty story. Um, and you know, one of the things that we learn in law enforcement, a lot of politicians don't like to, to talk about this. 
but the greatest crime prevention tool is incarceration of criminals. If they're in jail, they're not committing crime. So the more we let out, and you know, let them out. They're human beings. They're, you know, they have hearts and souls just like we do. And that's all well and good. However, the great majority of them are what we in law enforcement call professional criminals. That's what they do for a living. And you look, these vehicle break-ins, I mean, they, they, they're tracking a lot of them now because it's, it, it's, you know, it's something that's gotten a lot of attention. Some of them go to jail. What do they do when they get out of jail? They go right back to the exact same thing. I mean, this young lady that threw the dog off the seventh floor, 13 times on probation. It's not like, it's not like she's never been caught. 13 times. It, I mean, it's professional criminals. Prop 47 was passed by the voters in uh, 2014 authored by our district attorney. It significantly redu reduces sentence for property crimes and narcotics offenses. From my perspective, it's not about being conservative or liberal. It's about being naive, naive about drugs and the problem we have with drugs in our society. LA City Councilman and uh, former LA Police Chief Bernard Parks is a very good friend of mine. He came out against Prop 47. And basically what he said is the authors do not acknowledge that the drug, the drug users, the addicts, they have to pay for their drugs. Nobody gives it to them for free. So what do they do? They commit crimes. They commit burglaries. They commit robberies. And this is a, uh, an ongoing thing. Uh, as uh, Chief Park says, nobody gives drugs for free. They have to rob or burglarize to support their habit. Let me give you a vivid example from my personal life. Again, going back to my $54,000 palace on 19th Avenue. <laughs> One day, we get my wife and I get back from shopping. It was 1977. And I remember because my dog, my oldest daughter, was an infant. We pull into the garage, and uh, I, I've never, since I got back from Vietnam, I've never heard very well uh, some ear damage. Um, my wife says, Somebody's upstairs. I said, nah, Nobody's upstairs. And she goes, I hear somebody upstairs. So I start trying to figure out in my mind who could possibly be upstairs. Uh, who has a key? Would it be my sister? Or, you know, I'm going down the litany and it doesn't make any sense to me. So I run upstairs and I did not have a gun on. I had a t-shirt and Levi's and that was it. And I ran into my bedroom and there's a burglar. And he says, wait a minute, wait a minute. In looking through your stuff, I saw that you're a cop. I am so sorry. <laughs> it gets worse. It gets worse. He goes, I am, I am so sorry. He says, I'm a heroin addict. I was looking for money. He goes, I'll admit it to you. And I did break your front door. I, did, I have a ton of entrance. I have a gate now, but I didn't then. He says, I broke your front door, and I'll pay, pay you back. Oh, he says, I'm just so sorry. So the big dummy here is going, mm -hmm. <laughs> so all of a sudden, he Sunday punches me and caught me right on the tip of my chin. He's about 6'3", kind of thin, but uh, he was a big guy. And I went down, and I went down between the bed and the wall, a, a space about three feet, and he jumped right on top of me. And I, I couldn't get any leverage, you know? I, I, I kept thinking, I mean, obviously, being in police work, I've had defense tactics and had altercations in the past, but so I, my mind's racing. How do I get this guy off me? And he starts punching me in the face. You know, he's on top of me. I got his body weight on top of me and he's punching me. Well, he finally got tired of punching me. So he starts choking me. This is, this is a true story. 
I start gagging. And I say in my mind, this son of a bitch is killing me. I can't breathe. I'm choking. I'm gagging. My wife comes in with a 45 and she says, freeze or I'll blow your head off. <laughs> and he went to prison. And uh, But the point is, would this guy have burglarized the house if he had, didn't have a narcotics problem? Of course, he wouldn't have. The second thing is, would he have killed a police officer, which he would have if my wife hadn't come to my aid? I'm sure that wasn't his intent. He didn't come into the house thinking, I'm going to kill a cop. He wasn't that type of a guy. But the situation uh, that these narcotics addicts get themselves into lend itself to that type of thing. Recently, Randy Shaw, any of you know Randy Shaw? He, he runs the uh, Tenderloin Housing Clinic. And he's, he's very active in Tenderloin po politics. And he's perceived as being very liberal, which is fine. But he came out with an article a couple weeks ago. He went to a debate of the candidates for District 6 supervisor, which includes the Tenderloin. And they didn't talk about drug dealers. And Randy Shaw says, you know, you can talk about potty and bad smells and garbage, but that's not what scares people to death. What scares them to death is the drug dealers that control the streets of the Tenderloin. Now, this isn't coming from a cop. This is coming from Randy Shaw. So it begs the question, what is the city doing about it? What will the city do about it? Well, if you read the articles about it, they keep, including our district attorney, keep talking about drugs being a medical issue. Give it to the Department of Public Health. Well, the Department of Public Health, they're not police officers. They're not prosecutors. Sure, an addict needs medical attention at a certain point in their addiction. There's no question about it. But the fact of the matter is, the drugs are getting here through cartels who are, you know, like the mafia used to be, Al Capone type stuff. Uh, it's getting on the street through these dealers. Why did 750 people, probably young men, in Chicago kill each other last year? I suspect, I don't know this for a fact, but just being a cop, I suspect that a significant portion of them, a good 75%, it was drug turf. That's what the war is about, drug turf. So, uh, you know, to just simply dismiss it as a medical issue, uh, I don't think is reasonable. The most recent piece of legislation, uh, Senate Bill 10, which the governor just signed into law, which eliminates bail. It eliminates bail. When, when people are arrested, they have a, a calendar uh, based on the offense, and uh, uh, you go, most people have go, if you're rich, you can pay for it yourself. If you're not rich, you go to a bail bondsman, and you end up having to pay 10%, and they put up the bail for you, and then you get the bail back when you show up for court. If you don't show, uh, if you don't show up for court, then the bail bondsman goes looking for you. What was the guy's name? Dog the did dog the bail bondsman. He comes he comes looking for you. So uh, the the program the, the whole thing has been eliminated. The reason they say Jerry Brown et al. They say it discriminates against poor people because they don't have a lot of money. Well, it does. However, it also pretty much guarantees that people are gonna show up in court. So now the new system is the, the on-duty judge, if you will, you know, they, I guess they rotate it, uh, will take a look at the case and decide if the individual should be released or not released, and money will not become involved. Uh, I hope it works, but I have my doubts. 
How am I doing time wise? Mm, well, you got a question? Yeah. Right? So this um, elimination of the bail does that? Do we have the, the jail capacity to house all these people? Yeah, we in in, in uh, San Francisco the county jail does have capacity. In fact, they're they're talking about closing down the jail on the sixth floor of the Hall of Justice, which uh, I used to work at years ago when the police had it. Uh, so yes, we do have room. You got like five, ten more minutes. Okay, good enough. Um, yeah, I don't want to keep tie you up too long. Oh, I'm good. Whatever you guys need, don't worry about me. Okay. Uh, the other thing is uh, sanctuary city. We oh, we we all we all get to hear about that. Uh, it recently became an issue in the mayor's campaign because. Candidate Angela Aliotto said we need to change it, not to eliminate it, but to change it so that violent felons are turned over to ICE. That's what the candidate said. Uh, we all know about Kate Steinle getting shot down the Embarcadero, uh, Jose Zarate, uh, previously deported by ICE five times. I mean, we're not talking about somebody who just left the choir upstairs that accidentally got into a shooting, although Matt Gonzalez's attorney would have you believe that. Uh, that's not the case. Um, currently, here's what our uh, sanctuary law says, and I'm, this is a, not editorializing here, this is what it says. San Francisco will turn an immigrant over to ICE only if all of the three following requirements are complied with. One, the immigrant was arrested on a violent felony. Two, the judge finds that there's probable cause in that arrest to bring it to trial. Three, the immigrant has been convicted either of three felonies or one violent felony in the last four years. In other words, 20 burglary, if he's arrested for 20 burglaries or a single rape, he doesn't go to ICE. We keep him. Rape isn't considered, excuse me, rape is not considered a violent felony? Pardon? You're, are you rape is considered a violent, uh, violent crime, but you have to comply with all three steps and the, and the last one says that he has to be convicted prior of a violent crime. So if this is, a, if this is the first time we're charging him with, with a violent crime, it does not apply. Well, that's because he's presumed innocent until he's proven guilty. So they're saying don't turn him over until he's convicted of that. Well, that, that's what they're saying, yes. I mean, if that's the way you believe, that's fine. But, you know, we saw with uh, Zarate, what happened? He got off, got convicted of another crime, smaller, lesser crime. Did he have any violent hmm? crimes in his past? Who's that? Zarate. Zarate. Yeah, he's, he violated, uh, he'd been uh, violated five different times. So how come he didn't meet the criteria? Yeah. You know, I, 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 in that particular case, I'm not exactly sure. Okay. So, who came up with these, this criteria? Was that the supervisors? Or? The Board of Supervisors, yes. How do you view the current mayor's unlimited brief for the policy of the um, what's your What's your personal? Policy? You know, uh, London uh, was one of my students at USF in public administration. She took strategic planning from me and she was a wonderful student. And she asked me to be on her transition team on uh, public safety, which, which I was. I think she's got a lot of good ideas. She wants to do a lot of good things, but I also think she has a lot of pressure from people who support, for lack of a better term, being soft on crime. I mean, these, uh, these uh, injection uh, parlors that they want to open down in the Tenderloin. To me, it's just, it's mind-boggling. I'm sure the uh, uh, 
the Colombian and Mexican cartels are saying, oh boy, we're going to really do well in San Francisco. They can, they can shoot up in the comfort of a little parlor, you know? Un unbelievable. All right, where am I here? So, what can we do? What can you do? Certainly, you let the political leaders know that you expect government to provide for public safety. That's what you're supposed to do. Provide for your safety. That we find housing for this group of homeless today, and next week there's another group of homeless, and, and that the, the number remains static. And, uh, you know, how much, uh, in comparison to the police budget, it's probably about half of what the police budget is. So we've got to get serious about the, the, the priorities. Yes? On this comment you just made about homelessness, it's my understanding, having been a long time San Francisco resident, going back to the Reagan era, or whenever it was, mm -hmm. that they cut the funding for support uh, for medical treatment of schizophrenics. Yeah. And they put them out on the street. Yeah. And I used to go to a doctor's appointment over at Scott, at Scott Street. And I asked, I said, what's going on here? I've got these, you know, they're obviously schizophrenic uh -huh. and homeless. And I was told it's because there's no more government funding, federal or state, to treat the schizophrenics and, and they're out on the street as homeless. And, and, and there, there's, no, there's no question that that has an impact. And, and what we did when, when I was chief, we, we, we were the first police department to go to social services when Brian Cato was running social services and asked for help. And I went to Sandra Hernandez <laughs> over at Public Health and I asked for help. And one of the conclusions that we came up with in evaluating the homeless at that time, was it roughly one third were on narcotics, one third had mental health issues, and one third were people that were just down on their luck. So the, the, the unique thing about that is all three of them need a different approach. Exactly, I mean, to lump them as one, one label, I think is, is confusing the public, and, and it, it's too simple. Yeah. And, and, and the comment, one of the comments you made earlier about the newspaper article that talked about the fact that a, a major medical association canceled the convention, if I recall the article correctly, it specifically said because of the homeless problem. No, that was part of it. That, that they, that the, yeah, I have the, the article in my folder here if you want to take the, a look at the it. The physicians but were complaining and felt that they were getting approached or attacked. Well, in connection with aggressive panhandling does scare people. Right, I agree. You know, and it doesn't mean that the aggressive panhandler is going to rob you or punch you or do anything. But the mere fact that they're doing it is scary, particularly if you're from, uh, you know, some small town in the Midwest and you're not used to that type of urban environment. Even if you're San Francisco, I walk, I think it was eight, and there were several homeless, and I started walking in the middle of them, and they kind of started coming at me. I felt frightened. Oh, because of course, I had no of idea course. What they could do, and they were young. Yeah. And you don't know you're mentally ill. And yeah. And they're attack you thinking you're something else. Well, I was very frightened. Yeah. Cer certainly, anymore. certainly the issue of homelessness is above my pay grade here, but uh, uh, it's very, very complex. And I just uh, uh, reference uh, what Gavin Newsom said about it a couple of, uh, last week, I guess it was. Uh, we'll wrap that up just Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll finish up right now. We are a country of laws. Break the law, you suffer consequences. The legislative branch of government establishes narcotics laws and immigration laws. It's not about whether we like Donald Trump or not. It's a matter of the rule of law. Finally, support the San Francisco Police Department. We've got a real good chief. We've got a good bunch of officers. One of the things that bothers me is when something goes wrong in the police department, front page of today's Chronicle, uh, text messages by some really not clear thinking officers. Uh, the judge said that it can go to trial. I think there was 11 officers. Stupid stuff. Stupid, uh, 
emails back and forth. And then it, there was a conflict between the department and the federal government, so they sat on it rather than dealing with it quickly. And it's just an embarrassment to the whole police department. But the statement that I'd like to make is this. For every poor decision that a police officer makes, and police officers make poor decisions, we all know that. For every poor decision that they make, I would submit to you that they make a hundred decisions which provide for your safety and serve you well. So we can't let, let the, the one rotten apple uh, ruin the whole barrel. I mean, it, this is something that we need to deal with. Uh, police strategies do work. Uh, when I was chief, I had a couple of strategies. We targeted parole violators, had a great deal of success. Uh, we, uh, uh, we had a comprehensive program where the district captains came up with enforcement strategies. We had a lot of success. In my tenure, we reduced crime 30%. That was more than New York City did, and their chief got on the cover of Time Magazine. I didn't get on the cover of uh, Time Magazine. <laughs> and I'll, I'll tell, you, tell you one funny story, and then I'll let uh, Kevin, Kevin take <coughs> over. I was a captain out at Mission Station before I was chief. And uh, Mission Playground, where they had the swimming pool, it used to be called Nickel Pool, and 20th and uh, Valencia. The gangsters took over the pool, and kids couldn't go there anymore. And I'm the new captain. So the community wants to have a meeting, and uh, they're upset, you know. You've got to do something. They're scaring away all the little kids. The pool's for the kids, not for the gangsters, right? Of course, you know. So I said, I promise you I will clean this problem up. And I promise you I'll clean it up within six months. And at the end of six months, I'm going to come here with my family and my three little kids, and we're going to go swim in here. And maybe one of you can throw a barbecue so I can have something to eat while I'm here. So uh, in the meantime, I get appointed chief of police. So the guy from the mission calls me up and goes, you remember the promise you made? He goes, he goes it, it's going really well out at the pool, we got to admit. But we'd like you and your family to come out and we'll have a barbecue and we'll celebrate. So we went out there and uh, a lady from the examiner, reporter, I'm in the pool. And she, at the sight of the pool, she comes over and she says, she says, Chief, I know it's great that the gangsters aren't in the pool, but they're still around here. I said, yeah, and she says, and you're in a bathing suit. You don't have your gun. Aren't you scared? <laughs> and I told her, the only thing I'm scared of is somebody will think I'm Moby Dick and harpoon me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all for your attention. Thank you very much, Chief Tony Rivera, and uh, it is an honor to have you here this evening. Or well, it's still afternoon, so we're not leaving yet. Thanks so much for inviting me. All right. Our next speaker is Lee Goldstein. He's the founder and CEO of Real Safe Agent. Now, this is just a brief excerpt of a three-hour program that he normally does. So, in a word, he's an industry expert. Uh, goes across the country, going to different realtor associations, and trying to, because, you know, while San Francisco is a very unique city, a lot of the problems that we have with safety are the same problems that realtors have across the United States. So, let's see, he's got, uh, you know, you can go to podcasts and radio programs, um, you know, just Google, uh, Google Lee, and you'll find out more, and uh, we've got a great presentation for him today. Lee Goldstein, thank you. Thank you, Paul. So let's warm it up a little bit about me and my background because what you're going to see today is going to make a little bit more sense. I started my career out as a therapist for serial predators. I work primarily with serial rapists but also with serial murderers. Um, everything we've done is based on a behavioral model that I had developed while doing that. Um, perfect. We got some good things coming up here. Uh, I am also the only person ever to design a legitimate academic study into crime against real estate agents. Turned it over to a former colleague of mine at the University of Texas. That study involves not only surveys, but also interviewing victims and going into the prisons and interviewing those who committed the crimes. 
Some of the information you're going to see here comes from that. So we're going to talk a little bit about the psychology behind all of this stuff, but then we're also going to get into how, uh, what are the things that you can do to reduce your risk of being targeted. God forbid you do get targeted. Uh, how do you get a predator to lose interest? Because you actually can. Uh, also going to teach you some other kind of neat little tricks and tips. We don't have a lot of time, so I'm going to run through things as quickly as I can. First of all, it would help if I turned my little doohickey on. There we go, now it's on. All right, industry myth. Crime against agents is like opportunistic street crime. That is wrong. I realize you've been taught that your entire careers, but that is not true. Crime against real estate agents is predatory crime. When an agent gets attacked, they have literally been hunted. Literally, okay? Number two, gee, I'm safe because I always meet at the office and I get a copy of the driver's license. No, that's not true. That is a fallacy, okay? It can actually fall into a predator's hands. A predator's goal is to get you isolated where you cannot be seen or heard by others. That's a whole lot easier to do if you're feeling nice and trusting because I met you at the office and I gave you a copy of my driver's license. We even bonded, by the way, because I talked about the fact that my kid played soccer and he's nine years old. Because I knew that your kid is 10 years old and played soccer. I don't have a kid, not nine years old, and I hate soccer. Yeah. I need to talk about it because you shared it on your Facebook page. Thank you very much. So that way when I go upstairs and I go into that upstairs bathroom, you know, the one that doesn't have windows, and I say, hey, can you take a look at this? It looks like this is leaking. You'll be able to walk right in. Because I came to the office, I gave you a copy of my driver's license. By the way, the repeat rapist on average will have 11 victims before he is arrested for uh, rape the first time. And, by the way, 20, only 24% of rapists who are arrested for rape the first time have any type of felony conviction when they are arrested for rape the first time. Okay? These people are good at what they do. They're as good at what they do as you are at what you do. Okay? If they weren't, they'd be in jail. There's a reason why they're not in jail. So, I sell in an affluent area. We don't have very, we have very little crime. We don't have to worry about that. Predatory crime, affluence, has no effect whatsoever. I can tell if somebody is dangerous. Well, if you could, then no agent would ever be attacked, okay? There's a reason why I say get real, sell safe. Stop kidding yourself and stop kidding the people around you. That's how realtors get killed. By the way, you brought up Beverly Carter. <coughs> the year Beverly Carter was killed, she was only one of 24 agents who was killed by a predator while showing off, okay? Real facts, 5% of all agents have been victims of violent crime while showing a home, 5%. Which means there are probably at least three of you in this room who have been a victim at one point in time. 80% of crimes go unreported even to a spouse. That number goes higher, the wealthier, the more professional, the more educated someone is. By the way, when you look at just standard FBI numbers, and I didn't bring this up, I didn't bring this up earlier, but I also do a lot of work with the FBI. Standard FBI numbers, for instance, on rape is 74%. 74% of rape goes unreported. And yes, men do get raped. When a man gets raped, the unreport rate is over 96%. 30% of victims are men. So. For people who say, we don't have that problem, yes, you do, you just don't always hear about it. For people who say, gee, this is a woman's problem, no, it's an everybody problem. How many people are surprised by what they've seen so far? Huh? You want to see something even more surprising? Who's out there attacking real estate agents? White men, typically between the ages of 25 and 55. Typically middle to upper middle class. Typically either trades or white collar. Typically in a long-term relationship but not necessarily married. 
That's who's out there attacking real estate agents. It's me and him and him. <laughs> That's who it is. So mostly here. men. Mostly men. Almost, almost exclusively. It's very rare for a woman to be a predator. Oddly enough, they predate in other types of ways. Um, how many people figured that would be it? What else does that look like the profile for? How many people here are brokers? You brokers, don't you hope that somebody will pick up the phone and call one of your agents who meets this profile? <laughs> yeah. So, next time you hear an agent say, I know if somebody's dangerous, tell them to sit down and shut up and learn something so that they don't get assaulted, raped, or murdered. Because what you thought you knew, you didn't know. Okay couple of things I want to teach you and then we're going to go through and we're going to get into some of the other uh, uh, more practical stuff. There's two different types of criminals you're going to run into out there, predators and thieves, okay? The overwhelming majority of, uh, of what you're going to run into is in fact thieves, okay? But also the overwhelming majority of thieves are actually burglars, not robbers. Robbers, stick a gun at you, you'll give me your wallet. The incident you guys had at the open house is the exception, not the rule. That's the truth. Usually, what you're running into are burglars. In all cases, a thief's motive is profit. They have no emotional connection to the crime. This is how they put food on their table. And then some of them are very good at it. Their goal, what they need to commit their crime, is to be isolated where no one can see them or hear them. Okay? And the way they make their decisions is potential gain versus potential risk. The same way you guys make business decisions. The same way I make business decisions. And money is their attractor. Money, well, so on and so forth. By the way, neat little trick. How many people have ever showed a house to a couple? Right? Almost everybody has. Did you ever have a couple split up? When that happens, how do you know if... Uh, uh, your, if the house is being burglarized. It's actually really easy. If the man goes off and the woman stays with you, but hang on, there's two very specific behaviors that occur. Number one, if I'm a woman, what's my job in that scenario? My job is to keep your attention, right? Because the thief needs to be isolated, right? I can't steal if you're right there. So if I'm a woman and I need to hold somebody's attention, there's two possible scenarios. Number one, the agent is a man. Sorry, you just happen to be on my left-hand side. <laughs> Not big enough. All right, so the agent is a man. If I'm a woman, how do I hold a man's attention? Don't be shy, please. Well, I mean, I'm not going to go that far. We don't have to disrobe or anything. Right? If I'm just a little bit flirtatious, right? Because men, sorry, we're suckers, we're idiots. You could be a nine-eyed lizard, but if one of those eyes wink <laughs> at us, you have our attention. But if I'm a woman and I need to hold another woman's attention, how do I do it? Even over and above that. Because here's the thing. You can flatter me, but yeah, yeah, whatever. That doesn't connect with me. Close. Or somebody's, I can, like, close. I complain about my husband. I don't do it in a mean way. I do it in almost kind of teasing. Oh yeah, he's probably just going to go check the, you know, whatever. Yeah, right. Because it's a bonding. It's about bonding. Guys, criminals of all types are experts in human behavior. They are just as much of an expert in human behavior as I am. They have to be. Because that's how they commit their crime. I don't care if you're a thief or a predator. You have to understand if you're going to be good at what you do. You have to understand those worlds. You have to understand other people. Because you're manipulating other people into doing certain things. 
So, is it always the man? More than likely. And the reason is because it's very difficult for a man to hold another man's attention. Mm -hmm. And it's almost impossible for a man to hold another woman's attention, especially when he's posing as being a married man or a connected man. So, there are some other tricks I'm going to show you in a little bit here. Um, I normally have a little watch, but I don't have one. So will you periodically, will you just let me know if I'm starting to push long, and I'll wrap it up quick. Okay. Um, so, let's talk about the fun group, my people. Predators are a whole different can of worms, guys. First of all, they're the ones that grab the headlines. Okay, salt, rape, murder. Their motive is power and control. They get an emotional high off their crime and everything that leads up to their crime. And we're going to talk about all the things that lead up to their crime. Because the crime doesn't start when I meet you. The crime might start six months or a year earlier. Okay? Their goal, what they need to commit their crime, is to get you isolated where you can't be seen or heard by others. Right? I, I can't assault or rape or murder you if there are a bunch of people standing around. It's not going to happen. So there's a difference in how they're going to behave when they're with you. How do they make their decisions? They're filling an emotional need. Everything they do is to fill an emotional need. I'm going to freak you guys out just a little bit on that. What are they attracted to? If their motive is power and control, what are they going to be attracted to? Weakness, vulnerability, right? Subservience. I'm going to show you guys in a couple minutes how your professional photographs, how if you take it one way, it attracts predators. If you take it another way, it doesn't. Because a lot of you, well, I don't even have to look at your pictures. I know a lot of you have your pictures out there in a very dangerous way. And I'll show you what I mean in a minute. Okay. I want to talk about this briefly, and then we're going to move on. And the reason why I want to talk about what's called the offender cycle is because understanding the process that they go through will help you understand all the things and the all the things you can do and the opportunities you have to prevent this crime from occurring even before you know the criminal even exists or even before they even know you exist. But the other thing I want you to understand is this is an obsessive compulsive cycle. Okay? How many people, whether it's now or in the past, know people in their lives who are alcoholics? All right, so we've all seen this pattern, right? Everything's going along, everything is just fine. Something happens, could be internal, could be external, whatever it is, something happens, and I'm not going to do anything, I'm just going to have a drink. And they have one drink a night for a week, and everything is fine. And then that's not enough. And then it's three drinks a night the next week, and then five drinks a night the next week, and then the next week they're passed out on the floor every night. Right? We've all seen that pattern. Predator, it's the exact same thing. I've got an internal stressor or an external stressor. The one thing we do know is that it is always accompanied by feelings of worthlessness, powerlessness, being unloved, unlovable. And that starts the anxiety and the bad thoughts and bad feelings that I'm not going to do anything, I'm just going to look at some pictures. And so I go to bigdatarealestate.com and I start looking at pictures. And then after a little while, that's not enough to keep the bad thoughts and bad feelings away. And I'm not going to do anything, I'm just going to focus on these four or five or six. And I start learning more about you. I start going to your, 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 your websites, so on and so forth. I start learning more about you at a professional level. But then after a little while, that's not enough. Okay? And, and so I have to step it up. And now I enter into a deeper level of research where I'm researching you personally. And I enter into what we call the fantasy stage where I'm taking elements of your actual life and injecting them into a fantasy life that I have. Oddly enough, these fantasies are usually quite sweet and tender. They're kind of like romantic comedies. As odd and sick as that sounds. But then after a little while, that's not enough. And I'm not going to do anything <clears throat> I'm just going to meet her. That's a sudden, seemingly unimportant decision. Once I hit sud, 
I'm going to commit my crime. I can't not commit the crime. Now, remember, this is an obsessive compulsive thing. I'm meeting an emotional need. One of the things we know is that in every documented case of an attack on a real estate agent, the predator met with multiple agents prior to the attack. There's a lot of reasons for that. But one of them is, gee, I met with her and she brought her husband up here. <laughs> <laughs> and I picked up the phone and I called her and I don't know, I just wasn't feeling my mojo that day. And I picked up the phone and I called him and he was being all dominant. It's no fun. <laughs> and I picked up the phone and I called her. And it was great. She said, I'm here to meet all your real estate needs. <laughs> <laughs> I met her at the office, gave her a copy of her driver's license. We talked about our kids. We had coffee. Went to the house, I went into the bathroom, I found a leak, I asked her to come in and look at it, and I killed her. Mm. Uh -huh. And that's how it happens. It actually happened. Oh, yeah. Multiples. Yeah. It's not like this is uncommon, guys. 5%. It's a lot of people. And 80% goes unreported. Let's get into some real practical advice. How much time do we have left? We have about 10 to 15 minutes. 10 to 15 minutes, okay. I want you to understand something. I don't go into all this stuff because I want to freak you out, okay? In a longer class, I, I do it quite intentionally, I admit. <laughs> <laughs> I go into all this stuff because if, if you don't have at least an idea that, oh wow, Maybe this isn't the creepy guy on the corner. Maybe this isn't the gangbanger. Maybe this is different, right? The rules, the safety rules that people talk about, about staying safe on the street and so on, they don't apply here. This isn't that kind of crime. So that's why I get into some of the psychology behind it, to have that impact on you and to get you guys to start thinking in a different way. So, uh, quick, real super quick, timeline of crime. I will victim shock. This makes the point that this is predatory crime. Think about what I have to do to actually commit the crime. Whoops, wrong way, wrong way again. I have to actually shop for a victim. I have to pick a victim. To research my victim, I have to pick a site. I have to come up with a plan for how to get you to be at the site with me alone. I have to come up with a plan for how to get you isolated where you can't be seen or heard while we're at the site. I have to call you and execute on the plan to get you to go meet with me. I have to have the meeting. I have to set the stage, right, because I need to get you isolated. Um, and I still have to attack. And we didn't even get into the fact that, for instance, even if I'm not playing, even if you're not the agent that I'm going to attack that day, I will always be dominant. I want to make you uncomfortable. I want to make you uncomfortable because I get a little bit of a buzz off that. So I might invade body space. I might invade body space and lean in. I might issue a verbal command instead of a request. Instead of saying, hey, can we go look at the kitchen? Which is what normal people would say. I might say, go in the kitchen. I want to see the kitchen. I'm going to be dominant. When you are around people who are that dominant, it is extraordinarily uncomfortable even if you are not the target of their dominance. That's why we know that the behavioral marker in every single situation is that the agent who are with this person will become uncomfortable, even if they're not the person that the, that the predator will ultimately attack. All right, let's get to some more practical stuff. We've got about 10 minutes left. All right. How many people have seen pictures like this? Lots. Yeah, and then pictures like that. Your entire career, as you have been told, don't take sexy pictures, right? It's not the cleavage, it's the smile. It's not the cleavage, it's the smile. By the way, when we're talking about life and death stuff, I don't cut corners and I don't get into euphemisms. Sorry. So, here's the thing. A predator. What are they attracted to? Weakness, subservience, vulnerability. 
a photograph, as in real life, intimacy is vulnerability. Now think about it. When I say to you, give me the papers, let's sign the deal. Do you smile like this or do you smile like that? What do you think? When somebody you love looks at you and says, I love you, do you smile like this or do you smile like that? <laughs> Intimacy. These are visual cues that when these guys are scanning pictures, okay, head straight up and down, head tilt, personal smile. I call it the Bambi. All right. Also, notice her eyes are flatter than her eyes. Her smile is flatter. It points towards the lower connection of the ear. This smile point is bigger. It points towards the upper connection of the ear. So when whack job, and that is a clinical, job, a clinical term, when whack job is scanning photographs and looks and says, and they're looking at the photographs, and they come across to this one, oh, she gets me, she understands me. No, it's a picture! <laughs> whack job. But that sense of connection and intimacy. Professional photographers, we have one here, are trained and are taught how to, to teach you how to look, are trained how to teach you how to make a connection with another human being through a photograph. Here's the problem. If I am a buyer or a seller, and every study NAR has ever done says this. I'm not looking for my best friend. I'm not looking for a sex symbol. I'm not looking for Bambi. I don't care how many kids you have. I don't care. They're not my kids. I don't care how many you have. I don't care where you live. I care where I want to live. And I don't care. What I care about is this is the biggest, scariest transaction of my life. And I don't want to entrust that to somebody who's incompetent. This smile, this headshot projects power. It projects confidence. It projects authority. You will get more business with this and have less chance of being targeted by a predator. This, you get less business and have a greater chance of being targeted by a predator. By the way, I'm going to provide you guys with a whole year's worth of videos on stuff like this that you can share out. So, don't worry. So, uh, keep the shot above the shoulders. Keep your smile professional and confident. Okay? Head straight, eyes wide, upward smile. Head tilt, eyes relaxed, flat smile is a big no-no. Okay? No head tilting. Five minutes sleep. Five minutes, okay, you got it. Okay, let's talk about reducing the risk of being targeted in the marketing language. Do you remember we talked about subservient, right? I'm gonna be attracted to subservience. So let's say I'm a predator, I've targeted you, okay? And now I start, I'm looking at your website. If you're being subservient in your language, I'm here to serve all your real estate needs. You're just attracting me. You're, 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 you're stimulating me. You're feeding my attraction. But by changing your language, you increase the likelihood that I'll get bored and I'll move on to a different target, right? Experience to handle in the entire real estate process. Evaluate your statements. Am I being subservient? Am I being authoritative? Okay. Uh, uh, guys, every study that's ever been done, we already talked about. Truth of the matter is, legitimate buyers, they don't care about your family. They don't care about where you live. They don't care about your personal pictures of your favorite places. What they care about is, are you an expert in where I want to live? So instead of talking about, hey, I live here and my kids go here, so thank you very much for just letting a predator know where your kids go to school, Smart job, good parenting. <laughs> um, how about saying, hey, if you're looking to live in this area, there are three great supermarkets over here and over here and over here. This supermarket has really great produce. 
but sometimes their meats aren't that great. This supermarket, you know, if you're looking for quick in and out, they're great. By the way, if you're looking to do this, here's this over here, here's that over. This neighborhood has great parks. This neighborhood looks like it has great parks, but they really, they really don't. You're giving the consumer the information they really want without revealing any personal information. Okay? I'm sorry to say this, and it's not always popular, but you guys have gotten a lot of bad information over the years. Uh, I know that I need to wrap this up. So, uh, I want to cover this specifically for brokers. Okay? It's a little bit of cycle babble, and then I promise we're done. You guys have traditionally been told, gee, just always take somebody with you, and almost nobody ever does. And whenever something happens, somebody, there's always somebody around who says, oh, they were just being greedy or stupid or foolish or whatever. And that person is wrong. That's not why. Let's take a look at why. First of all, you guys are not greedy and foolish and et cetera, et cetera. That's not true. There are four key psychological processes working against people. Okay? One of them, and I won't go into all of them, but let's just, a uh, 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 perfect example. Um, emotion motivates not intellect. Okay? Unless I have had a scary experience, I'm actually more motivated. Uh, 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 uh. All right. If I've had a scary experience, then that motivation is real. That emotion is real. It's tangible to me. If I have it, it's theoretical. <clears throat> it's like, yeah, whatever. Now, we have all been in a place where we can remember a time when we weren't exactly sure where rent was going to come from next month. Right? Some of you may still be in there. And you remember the fear and the anxiety of that and how awful that is. So if we know that emotion motivates, not intellect, which am I going to be more motivated to make a better decision regarding? I need to put food on my table, or I need to be scared of this person. Okay? The way to get around this for you brokers is to start reorienting your people between high risk and low risk, and start teaching them how to identify things that indicate high risk or low risk. Because if I perceive, the mode of homogenization, if I perceive that this appointment is somehow different than those other hundred that I went on, then I'll react differently. So, okay. There's usually a lot of questions or some comments or other stuff. Which is worried because we need to wait for a lot of stuff and we don't want to take... No, no, we're good. Keep going. Rock on. Yes, ma'am. The photos of the two women in the, uh, you know, the one that you said is more professional and the other yes. one is, okay. Um, would, would the predator not at all go after the woman on the left? I mean, she's very pretty and she's smiling and if everything else seemed otherwise attractive, they, I still think they both would be targets. It's not a sex crime. My motive, if I'm a predator, my motive is not because I'm physically attracted to you. If that was the case, then, you know, hey, unattractive people would never be assaulted. <laughs> right? I mean, you know, your best bet would be to put on, you know, Coke bottle glasses and you know, things over there, right? But that's because the motive, and I realize that people, and, and, and we have a tendency to think that your attractiveness determines whether or not you're going to be targeted. But for a predator, it's different. I don't target people. If I'm a predator, and I realize when I'm teaching, I have a tendency to put things in the eye format, so let me just say, I've never assaulted, raped, or murdered. <laughs> okay, the murder part, no. But they deserved it. Um, okay, so, it's a joke. You got it. Relax. There's no reason why this can't be fun. Okay, now, I'm a predator. I'm a predator. Okay? Remember, my motive is power and control. I'm see this is an obsessive compulsive pattern. And regardless of what age. Regardless of what age. In your in your experience, are these predators you gave us a profile for the predator. Yep. 
Is there a, profile a similar for profile for the victim nope. as far as age group? Nope. I mean, it's all over the map. Going after the young, beautiful it's, agents versus nope. the it's all over the map. They and the reason like <laughs> And the reason why it's all over the map is because these aren't second, these aren't crimes of physical attractiveness. Okay? We look we look for a partner because we're physically uh, uh, we're physically attracted initially. Okay? But actually oddly enough so when we want to make that comparison, we use our own experience of that. But oddly enough, skip past that and go to the next piece of, of, of attraction in a relationship. How many people want to get a little bit more freaked out? Yeah. Come on, have a little fun with them. All right. You really want to get freaked out? Here's a little bit of freak out for you. A predator's goal is no different than the rest of us. They want to have a meaningful connection with another human being. This is a date for them. Except where you or I might make that meaningful connection by sitting on a couch holding hands watching Gilligan's Island's reruns. <laughs> Sorry, I'm a fan of Gilligan's Island. Um, that's not how a predator makes their connection. That assault, that rape, that murder, it is the most intimate act to a predator, believe it or not. And I want you to think about, for a second, think about how intimate a physical attack on somebody actually is. So when you think about, gee, why wouldn't it be a young, attractive woman versus somebody who's 55? That's because they didn't make a connection there. They're looking for a connection. This doesn't give me an emotional connection. This gives me an emotional connection. That's why. Of, of the crimes, are there statistics as far as other crimes that are perpetrated against a real estate agent inside, like a house, an open house or whatever? Uh -huh. Are more of them, more, the greater percentage of these predators or the result of a burglary or a theft? Um, the, overwhelming majority, the overwhelming majority of crime against real estate agents is predatory crime. And I, when I say overwhelming, I'm talking, it's not even worth talking about opportunistic crime. Also, by the way, open houses, then I'll be done, about a minute and about 60 seconds. Open houses, as a general rule of thumb, are not dangerous. Open houses have a high incidence of theft and a very low incidence of direct attack. Why? Because it's almost impossible if I'm a predator to get you isolated where you can't be seen or heard. That being said, when they are dangerous, it's at the end of the open house. Because if I'm a predator, I will show up 30 minutes beforehand when it's busy. I will find a place to hide. I will wait. Because remember, predators study prey. What's the first thing you do at the end of the open house? You recommended they do it. You remember? Lock the door. Lock the door. I'm a predator. I know. Look at have so much fun. You just locked it yourself in with me. Thank you. Guys, it's hard to find somebody to be with you at an open house for four or five hours. But it's pretty darn easy to find somebody who will show up and be there for the last 30 minutes. <coughs> okay? You close up your open houses with somebody there. You open up with somebody there, you close up with somebody there. Okay? And you don't lock the door until you know you've cleared the house. Or if you're going to lock that door, you darn better make sure that you're going through the house together. Don't do it alone. Showings have a very high incidence of violent attack, very low incidence of theft, except if I'm using you to case the joint. I have to end this because I know we're pushed up against hard. We've got a whole year's worth of videos that I'm going to share with the association that they will share with you. Okay? All kinds of good stuff.
and hopefully we will come make, back. Although we make you an offer. Okay, <laughs> he's going to make us an offer. Make it an offer to a native. <laughs> that, that you can refuse if you wish. Uh, uh, if you guys want to do a full blown three hour class, uh, I will come back. I will teach it. By the way, just so you guys know, I don't charge to do this kind of stuff. We have we have products, and if you noticed, I don't bring up the products when I do this. I you guys didn't show to get product. you didn't show up to get sold something. Okay, well I'll tell you where you can go see it. Tom Ferry seminar. I didn't bring the product. Yeah, 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 I don't. I, you guys don't show up to get sold stuff. So, um, but if you guys want. I will come back. We'll figure out a time. I'll come back. You guys can market it. I will be able to do for that. As many as you want to show me. Yeah, because we, you know, so I can present, present to the CEO. As many as many agents as you okay. guys want to shove into a room. Okay. I've literally taught, taught classes to 500 agents before. So yeah, we can talk. We can certainly. We're going to reach out to the managers' council. Reach out to our board. And since we have interest in this, go ahead. And I wanted to point out, I have twice been in San Francisco um, and come to one at the end of my uh, broker to my uh, open house. I was just lucky to detect this guy. He came in about 20 minutes earlier. He had a gun oh. here, and it was a weird thing with the shirt. It mm -hmm. caught my attention, and I was closing, but thank goodness there was another couple there. And I went to the woman like this. The husband didn't even notice. <laughs> She's going, and we're like, <laughs> like you know, they no, made him to no. stay. And then she said, okay. And then I turned to the guy and I said, oh, by the way, I'm sorry. You need to leave because they made an appointment and I need to pay attention. It's the end of the house. And I need to dedicate my attention to them. And he walked away. We were freaking out. I mean, we were really, really well, freaking out. The I'm statistics lying. are five percent. This is something that's yes. And yeah. then the second time, some other guy was outside, and I just happened to go to the balcony, and I noticed he had been there before. It was in the car, and it was the tour club. I called my husband. He came <laughs> right away, and I just stayed outside until my husband came and helped me close because oh. I felt that guy was waiting to come in. Oh. And now I don't do open houses alone at all. Oh, yeah, if, if, if you're gonna have an open reason, house, guys, if you're gonna do it, wow. careful. make sure you get somebody to show up the first 30 minutes and the last 30 yes. minutes. If you can't do that, then then, then don't have it. And, and you know, I hate to say that because the truth of the matter is you guys need to put food on the table, okay? And, and that's the reality. And most people who talk to you guys about safety ignore the fact that you still have to put food on the table, okay? Uh, um, that's one of the reasons like, why when I talk about don't use personal information, we talk about, well, okay, what do you put in there in its place to accomplish what you're trying to accomplish, but that doesn't put you at risk, okay? Think about what you're doing and how you're doing it. And one of the reasons why I showed you that chart, right, the motives, what the two different types of criminals need, right? One needs to get you isolated, one needs to isolate, so on and so forth, so that you can make more intelligent decisions. You don't have to be afraid of everything if you understand, okay, this situation is going to attract this kind of criminal, and so I need to put this in place, which is the proper countermeasure to that. How many people like football? <laughs> you guys are a rough crowd. <laughs> the team moved to Santa Clara, so the people don't care as much anymore. Everybody sells real estate, though. When you first got into real estate, you spent time sitting down with your broker, and your broker taught you how to overcome certain objections. Right? This kind of objection, you use this strategy, and this is what you say, this is what you do. Right? This is no different. Understanding how these people do what they do. Okay? Motive means opportunity. If you can remove the means or you can remove the opportunity, you prevent the crime from occurring. Okay? By the way, um, background checks are worthless. FBI, uh, Department of Justice does a report every two years and the most comprehensive criminal database in the country if, uh, uh, gives you an 8% chance of finding out that somebody committed a violent crime. 8%. And that's the most comprehensive one only available to law enforcement. So imagine what you actually get doing a, a little commercial one for me, N-Box. 
We are out of time, but Lee's going to provide us with a lot of videos, and we promise we're going to have him back, and we're also going to talk about his offer to do a little three-hour course. So thank you, everyone, for coming. And